Thank you again for coming by here on site as well as joining us online. Uh, and we're a bit, of course, as always, for, for this passionate topic on IP and video games, we're always a bit late, but um, we move ahead. So now if I can, we can kindly move to the next session and that's going to be the common IP fixes. Uh, and it's about the common questions lawyers get about IP from game developers. One perspective would be more from an outside counsel, the other perspective would be more from an in-house counsel. So if I could Kadi first ask uh, Michal Penkawa from Maruta Vachta to join us and have his presentation. Thanks again. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you Richard for introducing me. Uh, um, before I start, I'd just like to say that uh, Richard asked me to prepare a seemingly very easy task with uh, gathering up a couple of questions and responses to the most common questions that the outside council can receive from the developers. And by doing so, I uh, immediately realized that I would need like an entire day at least to go through half of the questions that I received. So having 20 minutes, I chose five of those. And the order of the, of the questions is completely random. Please do, not, uh, please do not think that there are less and more important questions on the list. I just put it in some kind of an order to, uh, to go through them rather smoothly. So without further ado, let's go with the, with the first question. And, uh, one, one more thing, uh, all of these questions uh, are gathered up from the perspective of the developer that does not have an inside counsel. So the, the 61st percent that was, uh, uh, that was the number that was given that by Christina in her presentation is, is for you guys. If there are any developers here listening to us either on site or online that does not have a lawyer either in house or outside, these questions are for you. And forgive me already that some of these questions may, may seem very trivial to you, but trust me, these are very important questions that I have often faced with my clients, all of them coming from my own experience and experience of my own clients. So these are not just, these are not just the made up questions for the purpose of this uh, presentation. Okay, so the first one. The first one is, may seem very, very trivial. Do you, developers that I encounter, that I work with for years, that I work with, and I'm not saying about the developers that they have just started their own companies or they don't have company yet, but I'm talking about companies that they exist in like for five or for six years. They're making, working on their second or even third games. They have publishers, they have investors, and still they do not take care, they don't care about paperwork. And by paperwork, I don't mean just agreements with publisher. I mean their internal paperwork, internal documents, memorandas, corporate documents. It is a nightmare. It is a nightmare because for many, for most of you guys who do video games, it's rather simple. You will just want to get some money and create a game, which is the, uh, the outcome of your own artistical feelings, behavior. You want to put your own feelings into the game. And apparently make some money out of it, and that's cool, that's very good. But you have to keep remember about documenting things. If you, if you, if you don't pay attention, if you don't put at least five to 10% of your time weekly to make sure that what you do inside with your team actually is somehow documented, you will get into trouble pretty fast. You will get into trouble not only at the stage of due diligence where you look for investors, but at the stage of uh, even facing a very, very tiny email coming from Steam. Do you have a certificate of residency? And there's like, what's that? I know it's not the IP question per se, but since you, Richard, uh, asked me to do the most important questions, I decided to go a little bit outside of the IP things. There, these are, of course, all connected. But without the certificate of residency, you will pay the entire withholding tax, for instance. So even this small piece of document that's for most countries in Europe and outside Europe is just a very small document that you send to the tax authority to receive the, the, the certificate of residency. If you don't have it, you pay more taxes. And that goes for taxes. When it goes to the IP, if you don't take care of the agreements, you do not have the agreements, there is no proof. There is no proof that there is something, that something was created. If you go to your friend or your former employee saying that, hey, dude, do you remember this, uh, this, 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 uh, this graph that you worked on 
this character that you developed for my game? And Hime said, no, I don't. And if you don't have any document on the records, well, there is no proof of existence. And if, uh, if there is no proof of existence, how can you prove that this is, this is your own IP, the IP that belongs to your company? And imagine the question coming from the investor or the publisher. Hey, we need to do some kind of uh, due diligence. Uh, uh, we uh, we, we want to sort out our own records with our partners and developers. So can you just upload all of the agreements of your uh, former and current employees? And then you say, well, we have uh, agreements with five of those, with 15 we don't, for 10 more we will look for. And that's a nightmare. Trust me, that's a real nightmare. Uh, out of those, uh, the, if you don't have agreements, there is a chance of, and this is a really harsh lesson that I hope you will never encounter in your life. A couple of my clients, I mentioned 30% of cases, faced a situation where they didn't have an agreement with their contractor for the creation of IP. So that contractor took money, they used the IP, and then that's the same contractor sold the same IP to another company that was paying attention to documenting things. And that was a nightmare. How it ended up? We miraculously uh, was, were able to strike a deal with that other company, but only because we had some personal connections with them. They agreed to extend to us a license to use the piece of work that was created as, a, as under, supposedly under work for hire principle by the company was, that felt that belief for years, for three or four years, that they are the owners of that piece of work. So this may happen, trust me, and it happens a lot. Investors, they are aware of these things. They, uh, they put more and more emphasis on, 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 on making this, uh, the, this, that, these things to, 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 make them, to make them stable. They, uh, there is less and less situations where the deals with investors are being terminated just because you don't have agreements. But like Goran said, if you don't have documents, the price, that the overall value valuation of your company will decrease. Because investor, there are good people on the business side when, do you, when they approach you and discussing the term sheet evaluation and the, the ticket for investment in your company. But then the lawyers of this investor step in and they are not that happy people anymore. They will pay attention to that. So please remember, always document, even if it's not a perfect document, even if you don't have access to lawyer, just download a template from internet. It's better to have something than nothing. Like worst case scenario, even if the, the transfer uh, of the IP to that certain piece of work is not perfect, at least you have proof that, that you tried. Even if you would miss some, some sort of uh, a few fields of exploitation of your, or you will not have secured the right to do derivative works out of work, you will at least have something to work on. To, to bring that person that worked for you to court or to negotiations with your lawyer and try to strike a deal to, 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 to make this thing happen in your, in your order. So that's, so that's one question that it's, uh, it's not necessarily always a question, it's also an observation. So the next one is that you don't read contracts. You are being offered a contract, you are being offered a document, you are being offered a term sheet, an SPA, a license agreement, EULA, anything in, in, in mind. You do not read contracts. And I'm not saying that to offend you, because by saying that you do not read contracts, I mean you, don't, you do not read through the contracts. Because uh, for most of developers, especially if you're um, uh, independent indie studios, especially if you're about to secure money for your first game, you just read through the numbers. Okay, so how much money will I get and when? This is the most important part. But you don't, through, you don't read through the all the legalese, all the limitations, the indemnity, the liability that you can agree, all the obligations that you assume by agreeing to that contract. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, a client of mine, a very successful Polish development studio that was, uh, that was being praised for creation of the very first game. They, uh, they earned multiple uh, million dollars out of the first game. And they were being asked by Hollywood studio, hey, let's make a movie out of your game. You'll be even more successful. We will, will bring your IP to the next level. And they were like, how awesome is that? It's cool, it's a dream come true. 
and they signed the contract, a very short, very simply drafted an option agreement, two pages. They didn't read it because in the very, the, the very front of the first page, there were a number, million dollars for the option, another millions for exercising the option, 24 months. It's a dream come true. Only after a couple of months ago, they wanted to make another game, a sequel to the first game. And they have been contacted by the lawyer from Hollywood. No, you can't do that. The IPRs, the game is ours. And they were like, what the hell? No, 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 no. We didn't agree to transferring rights to our game. We just signed the option contract for money so you can make a, a, a movie. It was like, no, look at the third page. I was like, oopsie. And what they did? Michael, we need, a, we, need a, we need help, we have a problem. You have to do something about it. And uh, there is nothing you can do about it. There is no lawyer in this country, in Europe, that can negotiate with the lawyers from Hollywood so once the contract is drafted and signed. It's done. What, what, uh, what saved the studio was, uh, was just uh, a coincidence, a coincidence that because of the changes in the management board in that Hollywood studio, they postponed production of that movie and the 24 uh, period expired and all of the rights reverted to the company. But for the remaining 18 months, once they realized what happened, they almost died out of stress. They, they even, they would have been even considering creating their, another company just for the sake of keep doing the business that they always want to do, it was, was making video games. After that, they read everything. But I'm telling you this story not to, uh, hopefully that you will never ever have to go through the same, through the same ordeal that they did, but just to read contracts. And a lesson to, to pick up out of this is that there is no such thing as market standard, boilerplate, we don't negotiate that, it's always in our agreement. Ask, ask, and ask. Even if you don't have access to either in-house lawyer or outside counsel, always ask as many questions as you can. You, they have to answer to your questions. Put them in emails, put them in writing, whatever. Put them on Slack, in any means of communication they can have. Because if they don't answer these questions, especially US lawyers, UK as well, if they don't answer the questions, or if they answer them incorrectly, or if they miss, or, or if they hide some kind of information that you specifically ask for, then you will have claims and grounds for terminating the contract based on the false, uh, false, false grounds. So this is extremely important. You can do it by yourself. You don't need lawyer for that. Of course, if you have a lawyer, you will have better questions because they will be prepared by that lawyer. But even without the lawyer, ask questions to the point that you, you have the best possible understanding of the contract that you have. And this is for negotiation. Of course, you have a number of parties like Steam, like, uh, like any of the console partners. And you, if you are an independent studio, you will not be able to negotiate that kind of contracts. And that's okay. It's not about reading the contract to negotiate the deal. It's the reading the contract to understand what you're stepping into. This is very, very important. Take, for instance, I almost said the name, oh, thank God I didn't, uh, provider, of the, uh, uh, provider of the online data storage servers used among the, among the video game developers throughout the entire world. If you look into the limitation of the liability, it says $500. And then comparing that to, to what, was, uh, what was asked by Richard and answered in the panel right before me, in terms of GDPR, if you do mobile game, if you do any game connected with internet, engaging people in multiplayer, MMO, doesn't matter. If you don't have your GDPR, if your, your data protection in order, you may be fine for that. And if you're fine with that, uh, if you're fine with that, some of the liability can, could be stamped onto your data processor. In that case, the provider of the data servers, unless they have limitation of liability and coming from US. So just keep in mind that it's not about negotiating the deal in a way that 
with, uh, except uh, instead of $500, they will pay $5 billion. They won't agree to that. It's either, it's a take it or leave it approach. But see, we at least understand what are the consequences of you not being able to gather your data protection aspects. So read the agreements always, please. Another one, it's, uh, it's probably, I struggle a bit whether that's supposed to be the number one because there is like the common misconception and I honestly, I would, I would like Gaetano to do the research on that and write a book about it. Who spread this news among people, not just in video game sector, that I can take a small bit of some other's work and it's okay. Apparently, it, everybody that's, it's, they have this, uh, almost everybody has the first encounter with video games or movies, music, anything. It's like, well, but I only took one small bit out of it. It doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. I put 99% cases. Trust me, you are, you are in this 99% cases where you cannot do that. To discuss and explain the 1%, we would need another session for that, but this is, that does not concern you. Always assume that if you're taking anything from others' work, you need permission. And if there's like this 1% one, 1 case, ask lawyer, they will dig, they dig into it, they will, they, will, they will provide you with an answer, and this answer will always start with, it depends. So always, always assume that you need permission, and that's the safe approach. For any video game developer that does not have legal support on a daily basis, never, never copy-paste anything from others' work. Under no circumstances, regardless of what you think about the other game. Even if it's old, there, are, there, are, there aren't any video games in the world that would be, uh, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the period of protection under copyright would, would expire. Our industry is too young for that, so don't even go into this direction. Public domain, mm, it's, it's a tricky part. It's a tricky part. Don't go this road. Uh, I will get to the open source in a bit, so we will talk about it in a different manner, but copy-pasting from others' work, it's just not the right way to go. It can result, I put these examples of what may happen to you just for you to, uh, to make a note. Feel free to, uh, to grab me over the coffee approach. I will, will be happy to discuss every one of it in, the, in details. But I just want to say to you that in most of the cases, if the, if the studio is small and uh, you're making the video game, no one, will, no one will come to you unless it's very big brands which are very highly protective about their own IP. There are not that many, honestly. So you may be thinking that, I took a tiny bit of this video game for the story or character or brand or anything else, and I'm still doing this and nobody bothers me, so it's okay. But when you start earning money, there is the deep pocket scenario. So once your game starting receiving, uh, collecting revenue, generating revenue, and out of the blue, Steam is pouring money into your account, at that time, the same studio that never bothered to uh, to reach out to you before, may knock on your door and say, okay, hi, now we will talk about it, about this very tiny piece that you took from my game six years ago. And you will have to pay. Because if you won't pay, they'll sue you. Others, the more protective, will just uh, file for injunction relief, and out of the blue, you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be informed by the court that, well, you have to strike down your game from early access, uh, from early access from Steam. And this is a nightmare because you probably already have an investor or a publisher or you put all of your money that you earned from the previous game and you have to strike down the game. That's a real problem. And it's a company killer in many cases. So uh, do not copy, do not copy paste under any circumstances. I will be happy to discuss uh, the opposite uh, opinions because there are many. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm usually challenged by, uh, by developers, by lawyers that saying that, but you can use this and this and this. I'll be happy to discuss, but for the sake of everybody listening to me right now, do not do that. Trust me. And now...
no worries. You don't have to copy paste anything from the sum and elsewhere of that. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, of course. And now we reach the source code. Now we reach the, the source code, which is uh, which is a backbone for most of the video games that are being created independently uh, by small studios, but not only by the small studios. And uh, again, the common misconception with open source is that if it's open source, it's by definition I can do whatever I want with the open source. Uh, we uh, yesterday we had very uh, a very nice conversation with Richard Egitan about Creative Commons licenses. These are licenses. If you say open source, they're still license. There are different genres, different types of licenses. There are just a few uh, on the screen, but these are licenses. Always, whenever you use open source, there is some kind of document behind it, regulating what you can do about it and what information, what obligations you assume to yourself if you decide to use open source. But in this case, it's completely fine to use open source. It is dedicated from people to people to use it, to work on it, and it's fine. The only thing is that you have to choose carefully on what kind of license type uh, it will be based. If it's the permissive license like the MIT, the most common, uh, the most common commonly used open source, uh, open source uh, uh, software uh, among video game developers, that's fine then you only have to attribute the, the creator, the, the source, and, and that's fine, you can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can make money out of it. But then again, I have clients that they created wonderful video games using GNU licenses, open source, and that was a problem. They didn't know about it, no one cared, because one of the developers responsible for creation of the jump mechanics in, in, the, in their shooter games just used the code because it worked. He didn't read anything. He didn't inform the management board about what he used. And of course, we found out about it at the, uh, uh, at the level of due diligence. When they have been offered a couple of million dollars but by, but by one of the investors, and we, uh, we found that, OK, but we have a problem. Because you have just, uh, uh, you have just uh, uh, used the strong copyleft source code in your game. And if you do this, the entire game is being treated in the same way. That's the problem. And of course, there are multiple, uh, multiple approaches, uh, especially from theoretical side. What happens when you use the strong copyleft code? On theoretical level, the entire code is already, uh, already corrupted. But in practicality, you just take out the code that was used on that and replace it with a new one before everybody knows. So that's a food for thought. Just do it. If, and if that happens to you, that's the last resort you can do. Once it goes public, it's, it's too late. It's too late. That's, that's source code. And the last one, but it's, uh, it's just a number. It's, that, it's also connected with, uh, with what, what I mentioned a second ago. It is very often that, especially video game companies that are like between one and three years old, you just don't know who made which part of the code, but not just code. It's, it goes the same with graphics, with any assets of the game. Especially when people fluctuate, they leave company, you come, you don't have, uh, you don't have order with your documents that I mentioned, so you don't know who, what person did what part of the game for you. And then there is a due diligence. Investors, lawyers come and ask, they ask a million questions, hundred questions about every single piece of, of, of software of the game that is being created by you and you don't know who created it. And that's a problem. That's a real, real issue. Depending on, uh, depending on your like, history with your employees, your memory, you may be able to remember who might be the person that created that part of of your game, and then reach out, find that person, and, and write an agreement, sign an agreement with that person, with that person, transferring all the rights to the game, postponed, after it happened, even a couple of years ago, that's fine. But if you, if you are not able to find that person, well, then the investment deal may deteriorate. The, the price tag that, they will, that you have been offered by the, uh, by the invest, investor may, may degrade. 
substantially, even to 30, 40 percent. I have seen situations like that. I have seen a situation where the author of the main character of the RPG game was unknown. And the entire marketing, the entire storyline of the game has been created around that person, around that character. They didn't know who created the, the character itself. Uh, so that's a problem. Thankfully, no one has ever reached out saying that I have created that character, so maybe uh, that person forgot itself or didn't want to disrupt the, the, the operation of the studio. But if you don't know who created the, the artwork, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a disastrous. Uh, Goran said that in his uh, presentation, that there is this chain of title in Serbia, very important, that you need to establish the, 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 the line, the, the line be of, of, of flow of the IP from the author to the company. And if you don't know the author, there is no IP. Uh, there is no IP, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot make it happen afterwards. It doesn't work like that. So it's a real, it's a real problem, especially in, uh, not just during uh, uh, like self-publishing, but especially when you, uh, when you encounter the, uh, the already called investors or publishers, because they will use every advantage on you to make the contract, to make the deal more beneficial for them and not to you. So, and that was the first one. I'm putting the Q&A session, but Richard told me to postpone it afterwards, so feel free to ask me anything you want, either here in a minute or, or after. I'm happy to answer. Thanks very much, uh, Michal. And, and we immediately jump uh, to Kaya, and I can kindly ask Christina to join us and have her presentation. In the meantime, when Christina's journey, favorite game? of all time? Oh, it's very easy, StarCraft. StarCraft. Christina, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Shavenets. I work at Madhead Games, and I am responsible for the legal and finance department of the company. I am very glad to be invited to talk here among these distinguished experts from their fields. So thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. I will, of course, try to keep it short, as this became kind of the mantra of the seminar. Uh, so um, I thought a lot about what am I going to say today, because you are exposed to a lot of experts and uh, academics and lawyers. So I think it's really important for us to kind of divide and uh, in that way show you all of the aspects that you may be interested in. Uh, what I did is I divided my um, presentation into two or three parts. So uh, I focused on the most common questions that we get, but the first part being, I'll show you, just a moment. The first part being um, more external, so concerning like the most typical questions that a gaming studio has when it comes to how you handle your external consultants, employees, visitors, what are your security standards, because all of these topics actually play a huge role in, in the way that you protect your IP rights. Because in case somebody walks in and see the game that you're working on on your computer screens of your colleagues, you are potentially exposed to a problem uh, if you're working on a larger IP and nobody should see what you're working on. This is also a problem. So what do you do? How do you actually protect yourself? I believe that this is um, like for the target audience being gamers and uh, gaming studios. I think it's very important to think about this for, even for a little bit. So what my advice for you would be is to have somebody in your studio who is dedicated to working on these questions. If you're a small studio with five to ten people and you don't have the resources yet, you should still focus on having one person who will handle these questions, who will handle uh, potential any legal questions or anything that might come up to you as like a a potential problem that should be solved. Uh, 
a lot of times we see CEOs or founders that don't have the time or the energy to uh, deal with all the questions, which is normal. But this is why you should focus this, delegate this to one person who will also be in charge of tomorrow contacting your lawyer or resolving any other questions that they have. So what do you do? Um, you should draft NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. You should always be aware that your external consultants need to sign an NDA before you talk to them. So don't just set up meetings and try to pitch ideas without having an NDA. This is also a good sign that you are a respectable company, that you understand that you should protect yourselves. This also comes with potential employees. Why not? You can always ask people to sign an NDA before having an interview, especially if you're working on your own IP or if even more if you're working on somebody else's. So you should always be aware that somebody, sometimes maybe you will say some juicy details to somebody to get them to get employed to the company, but you're actually exposing them to your intellectual property or giving them more information that they should know. Um, this also goes to visit for visitors to the studio. For example, our company, Metal Games, we already have 150 people, so it's a huge studio. We have visitors often. We have students, internships, and everything else that comes with it. Uh, of course, NDAs are in place, and you should always like make sure to just prepare a little bit the people who are coming in and say, you know, the creative industry, the idea is everything. So if you just go around spreading it and talking too much about it, you can maybe jeopardize your intellectual property without really being aware of it. Uh, when it comes to security standards, this is actually a, a topic where you should include your legal or your person that we said you dedicated to these questions with your IT department or your IT specialist, whoever is in charge of handing out computers, making sure the equipment is working and everything else. You should be aware that your security standards should be high. So uh, how are they logging on to their um, laptop, who can see what they're doing, your employees, like you should just take a minute to reflect on, on this also as, as a part of just being secure with your, with your IP. So um, <clears throat> the other type of the most common questions which I would say is uh, more is, is a question that you actually address when you start making the game. So this is like another scenario. So what happens when you want to implement something in your game, which is also a very, very common question that, that we get asked in, in my company especially. So uh, a lot of times game developers tend to have this passion and enthusiasm at the beginning, but they also think that, oh, I just heard some really good song and it says it's free on the website. I'll just download it and, and add it to the game, you know? Or, oh, well, this license seems to be free. Um, I could just make a free account and just download it and not read the terms and then potentially end up in problems. So uh, also what my advice would be when it comes to these, these, these questions is, um, again, you need a dedicated person who takes care of this stuff. So somebody who is actually in charge of being aware what, which licenses that you want. And before buying them, uh, where from were they buy? What was the website? Did you buy the um, free plan or did you actually buy the company plan for licenses, which is very important because you cannot use anything from anywhere for your video game. They are, there are restrictions. And fortunately for you, you don't really have to be a lawyer to know them. Yes, you have to invest a lot more time if you're not from the legal profession, but it is possible for you to just scan through the terms and be aware which package you should buy and not just go for the free version uh, just because it's free or go to the cheapest one just because it's the cheapest one. So pay attention because these plans usually include, um, you can use them for commercial purposes, you cannot use them for commercial purposes. So just be aware of these like, um, well, I wouldn't say that they're uh, small letters. They're pretty capital on the, on the licenses websites, so just be aware of this. When it comes to music, this is also a really common question. All, pretty much all video games have some kind of music. Um, what I've seen 
what, what sometimes happens actually is that we want to produce our own music. So as, as the bigger the company gets, the more things you will wish to do on your own and not really outsource or buy from somewhere else. When you're doing this, it's very important to have your own like audio or sound department which will be making the music because this way you are actually uh, retaining the intellectual property rights made by your employees for the company for this specific game. This is something original that is made in-house and you don't have to worry about it. In case you are buying the music from somebody, you should definitely uh, take note to make a contract with the person who is making you the music, very important, and also to just to be sure that you have the IP clause in there that this is going to be your music once it's made for you and also to make sure that you discuss the format, the timeline, when it should be produced for you, what are, where are you going to use it so you don't want to get somebody somebody's song that you can't really incorporate in the game. So also technical aspects need to be considered. Um, this is, I think this is also very important because it's something that doesn't skip anybody who's working on video games. Pictures from the internet, this is an interesting also topic. I've heard a lot of people just downloading things from the internet and adding them to the game. Um, I've also experienced this uh, where we, um, where actually somebody's team lead realized that the person was just downloading some something that he or she liked and adding it to the game. Very, very dangerous. Uh, the same as what my colleague just told you. Um, don't do that. Don't just go around copy-pasting things from the internet without being definitely aware that you can use it freely for commercial purposes. So that's pictures are a very sensitive topic. I would definitely uh, advise you to think through it and to also ask your person in the company who is um, who should be taking care of these of these things. Also, sometimes I get asked about fonts that you find online. So um, developers want to write something in the game or just use a font that they really like. Um, this can also sometimes be a font that you can use freely and commercially, and this is like the most common questions are actually really easy to answer once you Google it and check if, if they can be used or not. Um, what also happens is that sometimes they find some very interesting fonts that uh, are not being used freely or they're made by a single person. What you can do is you can contact the person and say, hello, I am from this, in this company, we're very interested in buying this font, we need to use it freely and commercially, do you want to maybe make a contract about it and just sell it to us so we can use it. In case you don't do this, then don't use it because um, you will just get exposed to having something which does not really um, belong to you. So I would say that these two things, like these two topics that I've just went over, are the most common ones that you will see. So you should always divide your thinking when thinking about your intellectual property divided into what is the company doing, like where am I exposed as a company, who is seeing this, who is working on this, uh, what are we doing with external people, consultants, visitors and everything, and divide the other part of my intellectual property regarding my games. So what am I doing that can infringe potentially the originality of the game? What am I downloading? Where are my licenses? Try to start as early as possible and to keep track of this because I think it's very easy if you just have one procedure that you're following. So anytime somebody downloads something, a license buys it online, to just add it to a simple table where you will see the name of the license, when it was bought, by whom, and which were the login details that were used. This will really help you a lot if you just kind of have a clear view what you have and don't have in, in the company. And also when you want to buy something again, you can always just check in the table if it's already bought and just use the account that you already used. So the third thing that I like to discuss uh, is selling your company. So this is like a um, kind of 
I didn't want to say the third uh, topic because it's a little bit different than the first two. The first two are something that you will use definitely when working uh, in your in your company almost day to day. But this is like a once in a lifetime probably opportunity if you want to sell your company, of course. Um, and this is a topic that has been already addressed by various speakers. So I will try not to repeat anything that you already heard. Um, but it's very important for you to think about your IP when negotiating your terms with the publisher. What are you actually selling? Are you selling your expertise? Are you selling uh, the number of people that you have developing the video game? Are you selling the IP that you made? That's going to be a huge hit. So just define what is your goal? What are you really negotiating about with the publisher? Because sometimes maybe your IPs are already sold to another publisher who published the game and you already had a profit from it, which is fine. Maybe they want to buy you as a company because you have a lot of experts or you have a specific, I don't know, cinematic knowledge on how to work in a video game. This is also legitimate. So just be aware of what it is that you are talking to uh, with the publisher. So are you the IP owner? Um, of course, if you are, and if you're selling it, or even if you are not the IP owner, even if the publisher is going to be, which is the most common case, um, where is your game going to be published? And of course, what are your legal obligations uh, towards the IP? So if you, if you think about this a little bit, um, you will realize that, of course, you need to be aware to have good employment contracts with your employees where they gave you the, the IPs that you have to be sure that what you really have as your assets of your company, intangible or tangible, doesn't matter, that they're actually yours to begin with. So um, this is something that I would also like to, to stress out regarding IP rights. So just uh, if you do the first two steps like you should, you shouldn't really have a problem with this because you will most likely have been ticked all the boxes when they ask you um, who made this part of the code. You will say my employees, they have employment contracts, it's all covered. If they ask you where is this character from, did you found it online, you will say no, I don't download anything online just like that. I have a procedure about it, take a look. Um, you know, if they ask you how many people do you enter into your offices, uh, have you really, have you been to any exhibitions to just kind of know if you are going around spreading the word or not? If they see you have NDAs and you are thinking consciously about not sharing a lot of information, of course, that gives you a lot of a better impression with, with the potential publisher or, or a potential buyer. I'm saying publisher, but it actually is by a buyer. So a lot of times it happens to be the same person. Uh, the other kind of uh, situation that you can have is when you're selling on Apple Store or on Google Play, um, which can happen that you can be um, contacted for maybe an infringement of IP rights. I had this in my career so far two times or maybe three. Uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that if you didn't infringe any rights, you won't really have that much of a problem um, showing that because usually these uh, infringement claims are very basic. This is at least my experience. So what do uh, some companies do? For example, I don't know, from a, from a country far, far away, uh, let's say from, from Asia, for example, they, um, they report you and your game for having been infringed, for you infringed the name, for example. And your, the name of your game is, I don't know, Magic Word for example. And so in this case, a lot of other games also use these words. It's nothing special, you know, but they've, this company has probably said to somebody, hey, let's do a little research who uses the same name and let's just send infringement claims to everybody. And I'm pretty sure that they send it to like 50 companies. And the way you respond is that you really uh, assess the situation, like, am I really infring infringing this? You check the game, which is you are uh, being accused of infringing. And if you see that there are no similarities, a couple of screenshots and a nice formatted letter would, should do the, the, the deal because if you are able to show that there is really no 
nothing similar except the name, and the name has been used in search for 60 times. Just type in, for example, magic words, and just screenshot like 60 results and send it to them. Usually, this will be enough. Uh, when you contact Google or Apple for support on this matter, they always tell you to try to deal with it directly with the person who is um, challenging you that you've been that you infringed uh, their rights. Um, this a lot of times ends really quickly and your game gets back on the, the Play Store and it's not really a big deal. And of course, it's not the most pleasant experience when somebody tells you that you infringed somebody else's rights. But um, I'm telling you, if you keep your um, kind of your standards clear and you know what you're doing, you shouldn't really be afraid, even if you enter into these situations like this, you will get out of them. If you get really panicked, you should contact a lawyer, but, or maybe in any case, of course, but uh, I'm just saying that these things happen and they are a part of doing business in video games and there's just a lot of uh, things that sometimes are there to kind of scare you, but if you know what you're doing, you shouldn't really um, stress a lot about it. Like, it's just really important to keep your, your priorities clean and your procedures clean. So these would be some of the things that um, I, I have encountered so far and that I work on in my company. And um, of course, I will always encourage you to um, have a person who you will turn to in these situations. Uh, if this is your lawyer that you trust, it's fine. But I would always, uh, I would always advise for it to be somebody in-house who is working in your company, who understands your product, who understands your game, who understands your employees, who knows your processes, and who can help you. Of course, uh, the smaller the studio, the more this person has to do. Um, sometimes they have to deal with employment law and a little bit of IP and a little bit of NDAs and everything else, so you kind of have a broader perspective if you have less people and you, your expectations of the person who is in charge of this should be pretty high in, in regard of what the person can handle. But as your a company grows bigger or your studio becomes bigger, the more narrow you will become at one point, you will have enough money and resources and you will want a legal professional to be able to sit a full time with you in your company and just make sure that every employment contract is signed, every NDA, that every other contract that you're doing is, is okay, that somebody checked it, looked into it, that somebody is going over the procedures what have you installed, where are your license stored, uh, what are tax obligations regarding the licenses and stuff like that. This would definitely be my suggestion um, because I think it will relieve a lot of stress from the owner, the founder, the management. Um, because at the end of the day, I completely understand that nobody wants to read legal documents or le re read a lot of law legislation or laws. And it's just totally fine. This is why we, um, this is why I have a job and this is why we go to university and study law to do these things. And this is why hiring a person who, who's doing this for you is actually um, a really good step, which will let you be free from having to think about these things. And of course, having uh, enough confidence that this person will come to you and say, hey, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with this. Let's call a lawyer when they need it. This is also very important because nobody can know it all, of course. So um, I wouldn't take much of your time. I think I've covered the most um, important things, in my opinion, that I see day to day in the company. Um, thank you. Thanks, Christina. It's a really great presentation. We have some five, 10 minutes again underlining we're always always going to be running late we have but we have some let's use the five ten minutes for some questions and answers uh i'll start with mine actually and the first so i arrived in belgrade i have that friend of mine we developed that we developed a really cool game i did not listen to any advice neither for christine getano or uh, goran or zorica we have the game we put it online it's available for sale and there's someone else from a country from outside of uh, Serbia who basically copied my game. Uh, and 
they're, they have a much stronger infrastructure, much stronger marketing, and they're selling basically my title outside of uh, Serbia with much bigger success. Mihal, what would be your advice in that case for me? So the company in Serbia is bigger than you, they have more money, right? And that's your first game. It's a pickle. Uh, I, I won't go into uh, like the, the legal essay and what, what the law says, because you're on the, on the worst, worst position from the start here. But what I would recommend would be to, uh, to gather as much evidence as possible, wait them out until they, they went even deeper in the infringement uh, from the moment that you encounter it. Hopefully they would generate more money based on the more infringing part of your own game. Then you have a case, you never go to court in the first place, you go straight to them and strike a deal. And that deal, the best case scenario for you is that they will buy you out because you will not be able to force them to strike their game if they're bigger than you because they will just wait you out. They will, they, they will pour a lot of lawyers in the multiple jurisdictions. You will, you will, your company will die before you will get to the, the first judgment, probably, in most case scenarios, that's how it works. So the best case scenario for you is to get as much money as you can and start working on the new game. I'm sorry, that's reality. Thanks so much. Uh, Christina, can I ask you in that case, you know, you've been working much, many of us, of course, remotely uh, a lot in the recent times. And IP, of course, is something that has to be very closely kept. But in this reality of working remotely, how should a company like yours, for example, take care of its intellectual property among employees working remotely? across different jurisdictions very often. Yes, this is actually a really relevant topic for us, especially now since uh, we expanded Method Games also to um, Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So now we have it in the, so now we have the company in two um, countries and also we have various uh, consultants or I would say employees maybe in different uh, different countries as well since remote work has been alive and kicking since 2020 and in, uh, for you to stay relevant on the market I think it's uh, it's mandatory to to have remote employees and to just have this uh, option open um, what I would say is that your legal person uh, in-house or outside, wh whatever, should work very closely with your IT department or your CTO if you're a smaller company to uh, find the best solution on how people can work remotely without you being always afraid that they might infringe your rights, copy your game, distribute it without your consent or just distribute it earlier than you expect and, and similar things. In my opinion, the best uh, legal solution would probably be to have, uh, to have all the equipment at your company and to have somebody just remote accessing the equipment. Of course, this needs to be, from a technical standpoint, very, very secure connection, and you will need to be very aware of what is happening to the equipment that stays in your company. I think this is the best solution, in my opinion. Of course, you can always, uh, I know that, that some companies uh, give allowance to people to buy to up to a certain amount, and then they uh, buy equipment in their own country then they can actually leave the equipment later, but you, they have to install your software, your licenses and everything else. This is also a common, uh, a common way to, to resolve this. But anyway, um, it is not a simple thing, but it's a very important topic. So definitely to like see what is your budget uh, to handle this and then to see um, with your um, legal professional and with your IT specialist, how are you going to address this? That would be my advice. Thanks, Christina. Any questions from the floor? Please, if we can get a microphone, that would be great. Yep. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Manja from Belgrade, Serbia, from a local game development studio. And um, these topics are very uh, close to what I do every day. I'm the operations manager at the company. 
But uh, the question relies on something that's not directly involved in, in um, the game production itself. I've realized that both Christina and Michal had um, memes and pictures in their presentations, which led me to a specific kind of question that relies on uh, what happens with when your game ends up in internet memes and how is that um, viewed from a legal standpoint? Because I understand that those memes and certain user-generated content, if you will, can be very beneficial to the develop developer themself, I themselves. And um, is there any case when these things tend to be um, kind of an unwanted occurrence? Your question was whether your, your game become a meme, right? Content, yeah. both your game or the content, or the content from, from your, from game. your game become meme. Yeah. So the question is, what do you want to do about it? That's before we can answer it's whether it's disturbing you or not. Because like coming from the, again, coming from the, from just pure legal perspective, I can write you a memo or legal opinion on the ways how to secure rights with respect to meme that have been the, uh, unlawfully, uh, illegally distributed over the internet, but that would be the theoretical side and there is the practical side. Mm -hmm. Even if you have rights to do so, and I'm not saying that in every single case you will, be, you will have basis for striking down that kind of meme, the context is very important, how it was used, right. what, part of, what, what part of your game has been memed. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, do you have resources to, in the first place, find that guy or girl, reach out to them, and then what's your request? What's your demand to strike the meme down? Once the meme is in the internet, even if you find the real author, it's multiplied in thousands or ten thousands. And if you make this case public, it, even, it, it will spread even more. So once again, there is a question of the theory versus reality, right? The mm -hmm. expectations versus practical outcome of your own actions. So if you would be my client, I would ask you the very same question. What do you want to achieve by taking actions, like any actions with respect to this meme? And uh, based on that, I would then say to you that, in my opinion, it may, may or may not have like practical sense from the legal perspective. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you. Yeah. Christina? Yes, I, I completely agree with uh, Mikhail. I really like his approach. I also um, share this approach where you have to think there is this legal part, of course, uh, of all of us that, that really want to explain to you all your options and everything that you can legally do. But then there is also this practical side of life where actually what is achievable and what is the result that you want to have is very different than from what the legal handbooks are going to tell you. So I agree with him. I, I see only two ways. So in case you really want this meme down and you really want to do something or at least to try to like make an impact on this person, um, then you can always like threaten him in a legal way, hmm. contact a lawyer, put up a, a, a memo and just write that you will take further legal action in case they don't strike out the meme or whatever this is of course if you know who posted it and you can actually have have a trace and you can hope for the best that this person will get scared or put it down or mm -hmm. it's just something that's you know done for fun uh, but in another case that you cannot find who did this you can maybe try it with a couple of persons but i wouldn't go further than that because i think it's very uh, it, it will cost you a lot, mm -hmm. it will probably give you some reputational damage, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which maybe you, you don't want. So uh, I wouldn't go further than having sent like one, maybe two notes, letters where you're from a lawyer with a stamp, you know, that kind of influences people. Uh, but on the other hand, if you don't really mind the meme, um, I would, my advice would be maybe to use it for marketing because if sure. you have a good marketing and communication mm. specialist, you can really turn things over for, for yourself. These memes have become really a problem because legally it's almost impossible to do anything. And even if you can do something, um, you know, the implications of it vary based on how much the meme was distributed. You know, if it was distributed a million times, then even if you have somebody who will pay you some damages, at the end, you're not really solving the problem. It, it already became viral. So this is, yeah, this is something where we can just uh, kind of 
try to intimidate the person to take it down or just use it for, for right so it's basically a trade-off you simply think about it that way yeah. gotcha thank you very much sure thanks very much uh i'll turn at this point as well to our online participants and anastasia i don't if there are any questions online yes thank you so the question online that came uh, actually quite nice fits to another um, IP right. It's uh, heavy on trademarks. And this is the question and the follow-up question, if I may, because it's a very long question. So I will read it out. So if I am the owner of a trademark registered for a certain territory, does this give me the power to treat all names or signs identical to my trademark from the same sector on that territory as trademark infringements. The follow-up question would be, do I have to respect common law trademarks from the territory, the same sign or name that was used uh, in commerce for years by a third party, but was never registered? So I'm gonna keep this uh, question or questions up because it's rather long. Thank you. And uh, we should, we're supposed to have the Trademark 101 session to, to, to actually appreciate the, like, the, 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 the content of this, but to try to, to answer the first question in a nutshell. If anyone registers a trademark in a certain territory, it has to also choose the, the goods and services, the class for which that trademark is being registered for. And with respect to this selected uh, classes for goods and services, if another person, entity or company uses the same or similar name or, or, or word, yes, then the person that registered the trademark can, uh, can, can, can strike the use of that down, can, can, uh, can reach out to that person with cease and desist letter, with, uh, with uh, this, that would be usually the very first step and in case of any trademark dispute, to say that basically, hey, you're using my name, you're using my registered trademark, I demand you that you stop doing this. What happens next? It's a very broad spectrum of things that may happen. The other party may just uh, just uh, uh, just agree to that and use that, uh, start using another name, may enter into dispute, may reply with a trademark attorney or do some sort of different things may try to register the same trademark in another jurisdictions slightly modify classes or to trade uh, goods and services it's a very broad spectrum of things but in general once you have trademark registered for the territory in certain classes for goods and services you are protected in that territory or territories with respect to that name Identical name, yes, but also similar names. But to answer the question of similarity with respect to trademarks, it's a rather difficult matter to do it in one minute. So let me just say that the, 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 the most common test that is being used by courts, by the uh, trademark offices, is that if a, if a general person, if a random person that is seeing the, any word, any sign that be, is being accused of uh, of infringing trademark of others may have reasonable opinion that that sign or word is coming from the person that has previously registered the trademark that gives a basis for trademark infringement. But this is a very, very high level overview of this approach. It, it, is, it is very, very complicated, much more complicated than this, than this answer. And as for the second question, the common law trademarks are not the general approach of trademarks in globally. Uh, usually the common law trademarks are situations reserved for US where there are two layers of protection with respect to the trademarks. There is common law protection and federal protection. And with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the federal protection, it's fairly to some extent similar to the approach in Europe. You register the trademark, you can use it and you can renew it. If there is infringement, you can do certain actions, but basically no one else can do uh, can, can use can use the same trademark as you did. With the common law approach, there is this famous uh, there is this famous case. I guess it was from Kentucky 
so uh, involving KFC or something like that. So basically there was a guy that opened up his bar back in 50s uh, before the Lemon Act was introduced in US and he had this small restaurant with, his, with the logo and he was just doing, it was a family business. He inherited this from his father, he was doing this business for years, intending that his own son will take on this business as well. Only one restaurant in one, in one town. Now there was this huge, uh, uh, huge corporation opening up uh, restaurants all over, the, all over the place, entire US, and they, of course, they open up uh, another restaurants, the restaurants in the same in the same state as as that guy, and they filed for uh, for copyright infringement because they previously registered the trademark on federal level, and that person won because the common law kicked in, saying that if he limited the use of the trademark even without registration to the small area that he always used that trademark before anyone else, unless anyone else registered the trademark in the entire states, he is allowed to doing so with this limited area as well. But then again, explaining trademark approach and, uh, and, 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 and legal factors behind it as are a little bit difficult for a very short answer. Yes, I agree with you. I would just like to quickly add also this, uh, since uh, Mikhail just answered about the US and kind of in a more international way, I can maybe focus on Serbia since <laughs> this is probably also interesting to a lot of, of listeners. So just to try to keep it short for the first question, um, yes, you are, if you registered your trademark, for the use in Serbia, and if you see somebody else using the same trademark as yours, of course, contact him or her, tell them to take it down, they cannot use it. If they try to oppose you, just contact a lawyer who will send the, your registration, patent, who will just enter into a more serious conversation if you see that things are not going as smooth as they should. But yes, you are registered, you are protected. This is one of the reasons why we, we register trademarks. So um, when it comes to the second question, um, well, so if, of course, uh, again, talking about Serbia, um, this happens quite a lot. And uh, there are a lot of actually really funny examples where sometimes when you go to the farmer's market, you can buy shoes that are not Nike, but like the sign is, is, is on the other side of it. And I suppose anybody who lives in Serbia has probably seen these shoes or they changed Adidas to Abidas or something like that. And you clearly see the intention and the intention is to infringe this, of course, world renowned trademark. Um, and yes, you will have problems in case you use somebody else's acclaimed uh, logo or picture or something that has been in use for years and you just show up and change the colors or change something because that way you are actually putting the consumers in a situation where they are confused who is, is this the same brand, is this another brand, and by doing that you are, you're actually infringing um, the law, so you might have problems about that if, if, they, if it comes to um, the owner. The, the famous case in the US, uh, the, 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 the example you, you made with the swoosh, the reverse swoosh of, yes. of, of Nike is, uh, I don't remember the, the, the date, but that's what it, was in, it involved the North Pole in the US, uh, the, 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 the producer manufacturer of the uh, of the polar blouses and so in, in one of the states in US uh, a father and a son decided to make uh, uh, a fun out of that and they created uh, the reverse sign saying that instead of North Pole saying South Bot and they, they have been uh, they have been confronted by the manufacturer of North Pole and, uh, and uh, ultimately they didn't have to pay damages but they had to strike down the manufacturing process Yes, your risk becomes higher as you kind of try to do this on a higher level, of course. I mean, that, that's also like in practical life. Yeah. Thanks, Mihal, Christina. Uh, and we need to break for that lunch. We need to eat something a lot. Uh, and we're back at 13.
40 inside the room with the next presentation so that the people are on site that might not be enough to have the full lunch. So of course, please come when, uh, whenever possible, but we restart because of our next online presentations at 1340. And just before we break, Christina, the most important question of the day, favorite game of all time? Okay, um, so I, I have to say that when I was a kid, uh, the first game I played was uh, Lara Croft. So that is like my all time favorite and it kind of showed me as a little girl how amazing uh, women characters can be and I think this is very important for, for little girls to just be kind of represented and to see that you don't have to, it, it doesn't always have to be a guy who saves the day. But uh, for now, I would say that my favorite game is Cars Above, which is made by Madhead Games, and you will have to wait just a little bit longer before you can play it. The trailer doesn't look awesome, thanks. And we break until 1340.